Greetings, everyone. Please know that we are recording these sessions for later distribution through the Chavez Echo website. Uh, we are excited to have you all join us today for the Chavez Echo series. Um, I'm Kato Kawasaki, and I am with the UT Health San Antonio Echo Super Hub. I just have a, a few uh, housekeeping announcements before I pass things over to Dr. Stigman Renados to continue with the introductions. Uh, thank you, Shreya. Perfect. Um, so here's our agenda for today. We'll start off with some introductions and announcements, um, then move on to presentations by Maya um, and Dr. Granados, uh, with Liliana um, helping us facilitate the Q&A sessions. Um, and during the session, please stay muted unless you're speaking, um, but we do encourage you to speak. If you've joined by computer, your mute button is on the bottom left of your Zoom controls. Or if you're on the phone, just press star six to unmute. Um, you can also use the reactions menu to raise your hand, or you can use the chat to ask questions. Answer questions and share any perspectives you may have anytime during the session. And finally, please note that no protected health information is allowed in either the chat or in our discussions. Uh, the session is brought to you at next slide, please. Thank you. Um, this session is brought to you by the Rockefeller University Clinical Directors Network, Texas State University, San Diego State University, and UT Health San Antonio ECHO. And our ECHO Hub team members are listed here. Um, next slide. The topic of discussion today is interprofessional team approaches to Chaga City's management. Um, this is our last session of the four-part series. Um, in case you missed our previous sessions, you can visit our website to view the recordings. Um, we will drop the link to our China's Echo website um, in the chat momentarily. Also, we will be offering continuing education credits for providers and nurses at 1.5 hour CME, CME credits for each session. Um, towards the end of the session, we will send out a link to an evaluation survey. Um, please fill it out to receive free CME or CME credits. And I will now pass things over to Dr. Venoms. Hi, thanks, Kato. I actually think we're going to pass on to Deliana first. Oh, am I Thank going to do so much? Yo, yeah, yeah. Okay. Whatever you would like to do. Oh, I am totally game for it. <laughs> if you want to go over um, CDN information, that would be fantastic. And then we'll we'll go whenever after the poll questions. Well, I think that you know everything that we wanted to make sure was communicated to you is on the slide that this is a Chagas disease educational series. We really are most interested in working with community-based clinicians and staff. The continuing medical education accreditation for this is coming out of um, the ECHO Center for, for the series that, that uh, was just described to you, Clinical Directors Network and the Rockefeller University Center for Clinical and Translational Science. Uh, with support from the foundation is helping with uh, the entire project. And so this is, um, you know, the the pilot project where we're trying to look at Chagas disease as an emerging infectious disease in the United States. Uh, many of you have been working in Latin America and have greater experience with this, but this is really to try and make sure that those clinicians and those of us working on staff, uh, particularly with populations have an opportunity. And so it is funded uh, by the uh, Strava's uh, Foundation for their Institute for Global Infectious Disease Research. And these are all of our partners. Next slide. Um, and so I think many of you are familiar with the Clinical Directors Network. It is New York based. They have been for you know multiple decades involved in practice-based research. Uh, much of it as the um, ARC designated center of excellence for practice-based research and learning um, and a network of safety net practice-based research networks, sort of working in concert with one another dedicated to improving access to care and clinical outcomes. And this has been true with their dedication to low income and medically underserved communities by creating those, those academic partnerships around research, education, training, and service. Uh, as you can see in the comments, we would really love to know who you are, who you're with. So if in the chat, you could give us a bit of an introduction, that would be really wonderful. Next slide. So we do want you to have a few reminders. You can click on the live transcript button. Um, that will give you a chance to see the captioning as we're going on. If you have questions, uh, 
then please, you know, put them in the chat so that we can either have respond to them live from one of the speakers, or we can make sure that a written response uh, gets sent to you in that same medium of the chat box. And it will be recorded and posted within a week. And so it'll be available at the um, address that you see there at the bottom so that if you would like to forward it to someone else or if you would like to see it again, it will be available to you. Next slide. And so we do want to present our speakers. Uh, Maya Karen is an MPH and you can see there she's uh, the Access Leader Lead Consultant for Neglected Disease Initiative. Um, and all of the work that she has done in terms of leading and managing public health projects um, in South Africa, South America, Europe, and the US, working about her primary research in neglected tropical diseases. She's finishing her doctorate in public health. We understand that she is all but dissertation and that she's doing an exceptional job and will be a doctor and probably we could have said it today, but we don't want to jinx it. So we're just being enthusiastic and encouraging to her because we know that it is all but done. Uh, next slide. And she'll be accompanied by Paula Stigler Granados, uh, who is an associate professor at the School of Public Health and Division Head of the Environmental Health Division at, and now I've forgotten your, your institution, Paula. I'm at San Diego State San University. San Diego State yeah. University, please there excuse me. So all of her work, and, and there's been a great deal of it in Chagas, uh, PI for the last eight years, as you see, for the CDC funded cooperative agreement. I think the effort to raise a greater understanding and uh, really motivated and pushed in the US by Paula and her colleagues. And so we're really quite grateful for her since she launched the Texas Chaga Task Force in 2015. And the next slide is just about me, which I don't know that it adds much to our current conversation. So we want to go ahead and go on to our next slide and say that there's going to be a few questions. So we'd like to do a couple of polls to see more about you and, and a bit of an, of an understanding of your experience and information around Chagas. So could I ask someone to bring up the first poll question, please? So do you have a Chagas screening tool in your center that you use? And we'll give this just a couple of seconds. If you don't mind telling us, are you screening for Chagas in your center or your place of employment? And we'll go ahead and close this poll so that we can go on. So no, a large number of you, and then a few are unsure. A uh, very small percentage though say yes. Okay, there we go. So let's go to our next poll question, if we could please. So then do you have patient education material available um, or, or can you access it easily for your patients? <clears throat> Let's go ahead and close that and see where we are. Okay, so more of you have, while you may not have a screening instrument, you do have educational material. That's wonderful. Can we close that and go to the next poll? And so have you had staff training on Chagas? Have you received training or have you offered training in your centers around Chagas? Let's go ahead and close that. Okay. So a third of you have had training or received training or offered training. Great. I believe that was our last poll, was it not? Wonderful. Then without further ado, Paula, can we turn to you and Maya and ask you to please take us through? You bet. Let me just share my screen. Thank you so much, Gal. We really appreciate you um, being here. And as I'm sharing my screen, I just wanted to take note. I was looking um, in the chat at um, everyone who's here, and we have a really interesting and wonderful variety of people from all different backgrounds and from across the entire United States here with us today. So 
Um, I've seen a lot of, uh, also a lot of nurses, and I know that in the past we haven't had as many, so welcome. We're happy to have all of you here. And I'm going to start off, we're going to, um, Maya and I are going to uh, tag team on this presentation. We're going to kind of go a little bit back and forth. I'm going to give a basic, um, very quick overview of Chagas disease. I do see a few new faces. Uh, and so I want to make sure we don't miss that. And also it's just a refresher for those of us that aren't deeply embedded in the topic. Um, we don't expect everyone to here to be an expert on this. And so um, and then I'm going to pass it on. To, or I'm going to talk a little bit about um, our interprofessional experiences and approaches that we've used. And then Maya is also going to talk about her experiences. And then we're going to launch into some case discussions. We really hope that this will be a very interactive session. That's what we um, always aim for. But this time in particular, because for those of you especially who may have been at future, I mean, sorry, previous presentations, um, we're going to hopefully see if you can help us navigate some complicated cases and figure out what we would do next. And we're going to change some of those scenarios around to um, what if some, something would have happened differently. So again, just a really quick overview. Um, Chagas disease, also sometimes known as American trypanosomiasis, caused by the parasite Trypanosoma cruzi, which you can see here um, in this picture typically transmitted to humans through contact with the feces of an infected triatamine bug. We call them kissing bugs here in the United States, but they have many other names that they go by in other places, but we'll just refer to them either as triatamines or kissing bugs um, for the purposes of this meeting. The basic epidemiology, it is considered an emerging disease of importance. Um, I'll talk a little bit about transmission here in a second, but it is associated with congenital transmission, um, blood uh, and organ transplantation transmissions in non-endemic countries, uh, more than it is with um, local transmission here in the United States. Uh, we do have local transmission, but it's, again, we think that the majority of the cases we have here are from um, other ways of contracting the disease. In the US, there's an estimate of about 300,000 individuals to be living infected with, uh, with T. cruzi or with Chagas disease, but this estimate does not include local transmission and is only based on imported case estimations from people that have uh, migrated to the US from other countries where we know the prevalence in those countries. So we, in public health and, and many other fields, also believe that this is uh, most likely an underreported number, but it is what we have to work with at this time. Some of the risk factors uh, for Chagas disease in the United States is it's generally considered to be higher among persons living and coming from Latin America where the disease is endemic. Um, this is a disease of the Americas, but anywhere we have people that have moved from the Americas um, to other countries where it's not endemic, we also find cases as well. So we find cases all across the United States, but we do also have local transmission that has been documented and is occurring, uh, particularly we're finding it in the Southern United States. Texas has been documenting quite a few um, local transmission cases now where it is also a reportable condition, which is helping um, the state to be able to track it a little bit better. Also in those warmer states, the climate is more suitable for the insect that transmits the parasite. I personally spend a lot of time looking at and thinking about local transmission. And so this is a, um, um, a priority on my plate, but there's, um, Maya is gonna talk a little bit about what it's like to live and work in places where it's not um, endemic in terms of the insect and the parasite living there. And then screening challenges. Sorry, Paula, can I just, yeah. Yeah, sorry, jump in. Jump in. But just in terms of geographic spread, because I think Texas um, and the southern U.S. is sort of the obvious um, part, but just to note that there have been local transmission cases further up north. So there's been um, reported cases now um, in the Midwest as well. So um, again, just something to think about when, uh, when we think about where this might be relevant. Thanks. Thanks. I actually hadn't heard that yet. So it's really great that we're all sharing this information. These networks are important. So we know what's going on. Um, yeah, absolutely. And we, we've actually been talking a lot about climate change and what that means for the United States with longer warm periods um, and the potential for increased exposure risks. And so absolutely, local transmission is something we should be talking about in the United States um, as well. 
And with screening challenges, you know, this there's a lack of routine screening. It's not um uh, it's not a disease that's on a lot of people's radars, and so there is underreporting, and it makes it really difficult to estimate the true prevalence here in the United States. So this is something we're working on changing, and we're going to talk about targeting specific populations um, for starting screening programs. So the basic transmission, um, insect vector is generally the way that uh, most people tend to get infected. It's um, the kissing bug here you can see in this photo is just one of them. We have 11 different species in the United States, but I think there's more than 138 species total. So they do not all look like this, but they look very similar in terms of their, um, their physical structure. Uh, the parasites transmitted through the feces, so it's not through the bite itself. And also just to note that the bug itself has to be infected with the parasite and not all triatamines are infected. Also, as I mentioned earlier, there is non-vector transmission, so it can be transmitted through blood transfusion, organ transplantation, or congenital from mom to baby during pregnancy. And then other exposures, uh, a little bit more rare, have been reported, um, for example, accidental lab uh, problems, as well as some cases have been reported through oral transmission via contaminated food or beverages. And um, this, this can happen if the bug and its feces and the parasite end up getting into uh, food or drinks. The phases of Chagas disease, um, there's two phases. Uh, the second phase has two distinct um, uh, parts to it, but the acute phase is the first part. And then we have an indeterminate phase, which is a part of the considered chronic. And that is where it is asymptomatic. And then it will become determinant or symptomatic later in some people. And we have a little bit of a breakdown here about that. The acute phase generally lasts about eight to 10 weeks, tends to not have too many symptoms. Some people may present with fever, a mild flu-like illness. There's a variety of different um, presentations, but it's generally nonspecific or um, very few to little or no symptoms at all. After those eight to 10 weeks, it'll generally progress into the chronic phase. This is what we call that indeterminate form. It is a lifelong infection if it's left untreated. There are no signs or symptoms of Chagas disease while it is in this form. About 70 to 80%, thankfully, will remain indeterminate throughout life. However, they could be indeterminate without symptoms, but reactivate if they become immunocompromised or immunosuppressed. Um, that has happened in a few people, or probably more than a few people, but people that have received like organ transplantations, et cetera. And then 20 to 30%, unfortunately, will progress um, over years to decades into the determinant form where there will be symptoms of either Chagas cardiomyopathy or gastrointestinal disease. It presents in a variety of different forms of these um, two, two things in, within the heart and the GI tract. And so um, to note here, the optimal test, the optimal treatment phase is during that acute phase and the indeterminate form, the asymptomatic form. There's a lot of research that shows once it progresses into that determinate form of symptoms that it is very difficult to treat and can be managed, um, but it often can be fatal if it progresses to that, um, to that stage. So we've spent some time in our last sessions talking about diagnosis and diagnostics. Um, so I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time talking about it, but just to note, as I said, acute infection can be diagnosed. Usually it's done through um, uh, mi microscopic, um, looking at for the parasite. However, those levels tend to decrease quite rapidly and quickly, and it's not necessarily the best detection method. We mostly depend on diagnosis um, with serological testing. Uh, looking for the antibody to the parasite. A single test is not sufficiently sensitive and specific to make the diagnosis. Therefore, you need two or more tests that use different techniques and that detect those antibodies to different antigens. So um, CDC is also able to confirm if you have um, discordant results. And we also recommend you confirm any uh, case of Chagas disease before moving on to the next phase of treatment or management. Um, and the CDC does offer that testing for free you go through your local health department and we can talk a little bit more about that later, uh, but that is the general recommendation that uh, we, we recommend. Blood donation testing, they do test first time blood donors, but we don't recommend that for diagnosing Chagas disease. There's a lot of reasons for that. Um, one is that the test is quite sensitive and so sometimes um, it can produce false positives. And so that's why we're gonna talk about a case of someone receiving a letter from a blood donation center that said they tested positive and what would the next steps be? 
treatment. There are treatment options available in the United States. About 2018, I believe, is when FDA finally approved uh, use of bencidazole, which is um, generally the treatment that we recommend next to nifertamox as well. And these were FDA approved um, for use in ages 2 to 12 in the United States and nifertamox for um, 0 to 18 years here in the United States. It is a low, they are both low cost drugs. Uh, oftentimes they can be free for uninsured. It, however, um, does require a prescription from a physician and monitoring of the patient while taking the drug. It is, um, that's, I guess, part of the complicating factors of treatment protocols that the person really needs to be under monitoring from a physician. Lifelong regular cardiology checks after treatment are necessary. Again, there's no test for cure, so it's important that there are regular checkups done on the patient. Um, and I think I already just said patient needs monitoring, especially for side effects from, from treatment. And again, we're not gonna go into details about that here in this presentation, but we're happy to answer questions if they come up. So who do we screen for Chagas disease? Um, I put in here humans because we are also starting to talk about um, animal testing and, and using canines, especially for sentinels, for local transmission potential. But when we're talking about our um, human populations, these are some of the recommendations that have been made uh, through several publications that have come out and lots of um, experts talking about how do we prioritize screenings because uh, you, can't, you don't necessarily wanna screen everyone for this disease. And so here's a few that we've come up with. Any first generation or second generation person born in Latin America? Newborns or children of any seropositive women, family members of affected patients with Chagas disease. So if a mom or a sister or a daughter or a child tests positive, you would want to consider testing the rest of the family. Blood and organ donors, and this is being done now um, with more frequency. Um, first generation uh, persons being born in Latin America with unexplained cardiomyopathy, stroke, arrhythmias, or abnormal electrocardiograms, we would recommend screening, testing. Um, first generation also at increased risk of Chagas reactivation, such as having HIV or being a transplant recipient. Any pregnant women having lived in endemic areas, we highly recommend to be screened. And having a history of living in substandard conditions in areas where there is known triadamine activity, that could be in the US or in Latin America. If there's recognition, of kissing bugs, I should put a little asterisk next to this and say that there also are a lot of bugs that look like kissing bugs, and so this isn't always a high priority. However, if somebody shows a physician a photo or um, actually has the bug with them, and that happens sometimes, uh, and it is recognized as a kissing bug, we recommend uh, also screening them. And then this is on my list, especially thinking about local transmission, is do we want to screen people that their veterinarian diagnoses uh, with a Chagas positive dog? We're not gonna be talking about that much at this um, meeting, except for we will talk about how we work with veterinarians to um, conduct surveillance and educate their clients about the disease as well. And then lastly, this is a, um, an algorithm that you may have seen in previous presentations, or some of you may be seeing it for the first time. This is available in a publication that came out on recommendations for screening and diagnosis of Chagas disease in the US. I, I think there's several of the authors that are on the call um, right now. So you can see that this is basically, if you have one or more of these risk factors ranked in importance, born in or lived greater than six months in an endemic country, have a family member with Chagas disease, lived in housing made of natural materials in Mexico, Central or South America, or having a history of being bitten by kissing bugs or finding them in the home. And this is how you would um, think about screening um, the population and working through the protocol. So this is where, that was sort of the really quick Chagas 101. Um, and can, of course, if you do have questions, feel free to put them in the chat and or just raise your hand or interrupt. Um, we're, we're very open to, um, to talking this through with you all uh, as an interactive discussion. But Maya um, and I talked about- We ahead. have some questions. Uh, we have some questions in the chat. Okay. Yeah, so the the first question is, uh, are treating adults with Besni Dazol considered off-label? Uh, if only if they approved for two to 12 years old. And then okay. the second question is, uh, detection is critical, critical. How can we strengthen blood bank system to leverage this existing infrastructure 
uh, for detection. And then another question is, uh, so it is a response from our uh, Dr. Sue Montgomery, uh, the use of the drugs outside the FDA approved age ranges is based on clinical diagnosis and decision by the treating physician and their practice of medicine. Thank you, Zhu. And this was um, Dr. Montgomery responded, I think, to the first question. And um, Kath, you bring up a really great question about blood bank systems and levering that existing infrastructure for detection. Um, currently, again, you, doing first time blood donations is um, what they're doing. Again, they're starting to also screen more of the organs. And I know that we've had some recent changes uh, to the protocol for that, that I'm, I'm actually not fully aware of. I know Dr. Montgomery is, and I don't know if um, Sue, you wanna either speak out or put it in the chat. Um, but I think that the question about blood bank system is a rather, I guess it's a, it's a bigger question that I don't necessarily have all the answers to, but I do think that they're a key partner in our surveillance system. And um, we used to have we used to have surveillance where they were tracking the positive blood donations um, through this AABB. I always forget what that stands for, um, but unfortunately, pretty much during COVID is when that stopped. And I don't think that there's been renewed funding to con continue that. I do have a a picture of of what that map looks like to where you find positive blood donors from across the United States. But I do believe that working with blood banks, for example, if they do have a positive um, result on one of their blood donations that um, making sure that the person that they notify is also given a resource potentially. And we've done that in South Texas where the blood banks have added a physician's contact information who has agreed to be on those letters as a potential contact. Um, and then also connecting them with the local health departments where it's been reportable. And we're actually gonna talk about a case of that um, whenever we get to the case studies. So why again, I'm going to go back to why do we call it a village and we we're calling it a medical village, but then I was like, this is more than just a medical village, it, it, it goes beyond it's it's an entire holistic approach to addressing Chagas disease and we're going to talk a little bit more about about why that is and who are some of the players and some people you may have thought of and some you may not have. But Chagas disease management in the US is absolutely a collaborative multidisciplinary approach. And it's mostly because this is a, a complex disease and understanding the spread of it, the diagnosis and treatment prevention of it is a bit complicated. So there's a lot of collaborators, but there's also a lot of resources and quite a few people here right now today um, are experts on the topic and are stand ready to support any of you all who may have a patient or know of somebody that has the disease. So who are some of the possible collaborators and partners? And this is this interprofessional management and we're gonna get into more details about. We've obviously got physicians and healthcare providers, but we've also got public health agencies that are a strong, strong partner in this. Vector control agencies, thinking about educating our communities, especially in, in the Southern US and in the, all of the, actually the, the half of the United States, 30, 30 states, I believe now that have triadamine vectors. And so um, a huge portion of the United States vector control agencies uh, can be aware of this um, disease. Research institutions and scientists obviously doing the work to figure out how things are working. NGOs, advocacy groups, pharmaceutical companies, uh, veterinary and animal health professionals, very critical, especially in our um, states with local transmission potential. They uh, found working with veterinarians, they're quite, um, quite up to speed on the disease and able to um, communicate pretty pretty well about Chagas disease. It's, it's been a great partnership working with veterinarians. Academic institutions and educators, government health policymakers, um, international health organizations, learning what's working in other places, community leaders and advocates, and then obviously at-risk communities and patient advocacy groups like community health workers. Others, I'm sure there's more. Um, this is just a short list. Uh, we were talking earlier about different types of providers. Um, who would we work with, like cardiac centers? Uh, do we work with, you know, OBGYNs? And so there's a lot of room for this, and it's a huge list of, of people, but each person has a different role in understanding how we manage the disease. So I wanted to just uh, briefly mention challenges in the work that we have had. Um, as Dell had mentioned, I received a CDC grant who also um, uh, supports these ECHO efforts. And this was back in 2015. 
And part of our task was just to raise awareness about the topic. And since then, you know, it's it's been eight or nine years. A lot of challenges have been faced and um, we're overcoming a lot of them. But I think that this is sort of the ranking of how I would rank some of those challenges and how we have to work with others in order to um, address these. So reaching out to busy physicians on their networks. My goal has been to raise awareness with physicians and I never realized how difficult that could be just because they're so very busy and have so many other things um, on their plate and other diagnoses and things to manage like diabetes and other chronic conditions that it's difficult to, um, it's difficult to really express the, the different needs of this disease since it is a, a neglected disease and it's uh, not necessarily um, everyone is going to have it. It's, it's fairly rare. And so understanding how to best to reach out physicians is important. And I know that Maya will talk more about that. Also just the lack of awareness in general. There's a complete lack of awareness in the United States for the most part, at least there has been because it's neglected. And this is definitely an ongoing obstacle. And also there's sensitive populations that are most affected. They're often uninsured or sometimes use non-traditional ways of accessing healthcare or just flat out do not have access. And that's been making this disparity and access to healthcare quite complicated for the management of Chagas disease. And then just navigating a complex disease that has all these different barriers, like standards of diagnostics. It's not easy to recognize symptoms. Um, obviously there's no symptoms during that, uh, that first chronic stage, but even cardiologists, if they're not familiar with the disease can, can miss this. We work closely with several cardiologists who talk about um, how a, a Chagas case could just, you know, be right there in your face and you still might not notice it if you don't know a whole lot about the disease. So we talk a little bit about how other diseases that we have managed in the United States that have presented with similar barriers could provide insights. I know we talk in public health circles, especially about like hep C, um, how that's being managed in the United States or tuberculosis, uh, several other diseases that we could take a look at how they've been managed and and how they've moved through the process of understanding them. Paula? Yes? There's a question in the chat that talks about, you know, what is the financial burden on the healthcare system? Uh, because you have to know that so that you can determine the return on investment. And so as you're talking about complex diseases and others, I just wondered if you wanted to address that question as well. Um, Financial burden on the healthcare system. There's been a couple of researchers that have tried to calculate uh, what this financial burden is. I don't have those numbers in um, in front of me, and I, I see your question too. Could it be classified as a rare disease? You know, this is. I I don't feel I don't feel like an expert to be able to answer that question. I'm not a health economist or um, necessarily understand how we would want to classify diseases, but. I would say that local transmission is rare, but if you're talking about a population, for example, Bolivia or El Salvador, where the prevalence rate of that disease in that country could range between um, two to 10%, I wouldn't consider that rare in those populations. And so I think that uh, it depends on which populations you're referring to as it being a, a rare disease, I guess. And so when I did say, rare, I meant that if you're thinking about local transmission, maybe in a person that's never traveled outside of the United States, it probably would be less frequently encountered than it would if you're dealing with a population that has lived in endemic regions or their parents have come from endemic regions. Hopefully that answered your question. I think we'll dig into that a little bit more too. I, can I posted, I posted uh, a most recent uh, study on cost of Chagas disease. It was, it was published in uh, 2023. And they uh, talk about purchasing power parity and the average cost per patient is between uh, $25 and $19,000 uh, based on that uh, article. Great, and thank That's you. And I think Dr. Office. Montgomery also posted the congenital Chagas disease uh, cost screening uh, for screening in the chat as well. Yeah, and, and just to add, so the um, that first article is actually looks at both endemic and non-endemic countries, so it's not U.S. Um, specific. Um, there's been mm -hmm. uh, something that um, in general in neglected tropical diseases we don't do well is um, is this kind of analysis, and we really need to do more of it um, because there are significant costs. And oftentimes, just to be um, perfectly blunt, for people who may not 
be so connected to the communities or the patients themselves, oftentimes the figures will help to motivate people um, to kind of pay more attention and um, and the amount of money they could be saving or, um, or uh, yeah, avoiding spending. Um, so it works um, really well, but generally speaking, we don't do it um, enough. So if anyone... Um, <laughs> on this call wants to do that. I'm always happy to talk about doing um, cost effectiveness or cost of treatment um, analyses. Um, and then just in terms of it being classified as a rare disease, um, like Paula mentioned, it's it's really interesting to think about it that way because um, there are lots of other diseases in the United States that are much more well known that are actually probably less common than Chagas disease. Um, things that we screen for, um, you know, regularly. Um, so it's, yeah, it's kind of a, 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 a definition issue, I would say. So thank Sorry. you, everyone. Um, and I would agree that, you know, I was just talking with um, someone from uh, UC San Diego talking about screening pregnant women coming from Latin America for lead but they weren't screening for Chagas disease. And so it was one of those things where I have to kind of think to myself, you know, I don't really know, um, there's so many things to screen for. And so really, you know, how do we prioritize this? I agree with the economic analysis, we need more. We're doing one right now currently with the military, looking at the cost of um, what it would cost to enact prevention services as well as treatment and what happens if you don't treat and what that cost is. But stay tuned for that, that's not out yet. And then just lastly, uh, moving through this, I wanted to just to talk about the many successes. And I do see Cordell, you have your hand raised. Let me, um, actually I'll stop before I start this. Would you like to go ahead and ask your question? Oh, thank you. Um, I, I have two sm small questions. One, is there point of care testing for Chagas? Uh, Cause that could possibly be an easier way even though sometimes that may be more expensive. And, um, if uh, one of the community partners we've looked at is the migrant healthcare system, you know, for the farm work um, or field where I don't know what's the proper term, mm -hmm. but if they have healthcare on those farms or, or you know, some of employee health, would that be a good place uh, to partner um, for um, detecting shadows? Great question, Cordella. And yes, there are point of care tests. Um, there, uh, there are rapid tests. We're in the process sort of, I think in our circle of experts talking about feasibility of using them. There are um, false positives and there's some newer point of care tests that are coming out. So we are talking about the potential of that as a screening tool. Obviously, as we said before, diagnostics are a little complicated. You would wanna make sure you had additional testing done before uh, confirming the diagnosis and moving on to treatment. That's really, really important. And so, yes, there are options. Point of care testing is not very expensive. Um, however, it's it needs to be taken, again, with that understanding that additional tests have to be done. And yes, absolutely, partnering with some of these um, healthcare networks that work with migrant farm workers and very at-risk populations, absolutely essential. Again, those point of care tests would be a great tool to start. And, um, but also ensuring that these healthcare systems like the FQHCs that are working with these populations also have um, healthcare providers that understand the condition and know what to do and have access to infectious disease specialists and are also able to work closely in a trusting relationship with their population because that's also important because um, treatment does require monitoring and can take six to eight weeks, if not longer. And then also requires a lot of other testing to be done even to determine eligibility of treatment. Great question. And I do believe there's been some more um, conversations put in the chat. I just want to um, wrap up my section by just saying that a lot of the successes, and when I say, again, I say the village, not it's not just me and, and the CDC work that I've been doing, but it's uh, collectively many groups on here. I see um, Dr. Clark was just commenting and I know her and Dr. Whitman and several of us have been putting together these broad networks of groups that are working on Chagas disease. When I first started, um, I was really new to Chagas 
And I reached out in Texas to as many people as I could. And I found out there were some amazing people working on Chagas disease. Many of them didn't even know that each other were working on it. So bringing them together, that's when we formed that Texas Chagas Task Force. And it had physicians, veterinarians, entomologists, military, all these different um, public health officers, the, the local health departments, the state health department, really robust group of people passionate about the topic. And that was able to sort of create some momentum in the state to um, branch out further with our education efforts. Uh, USCN, the US Chagas Disease Network, um, again, another resource for providers. Integrating new partners into the network, CDN is a great example. I'm super excited when they called me up and said, we have a grant to work on Chagas Disease. I just said, yes, let's do this. Let's work um, together. You have a huge network. We have a lot of experts. Let's get together. Also our UT Health Echo Network, our area health education centers for our community health workers as well. So all of these collaborations facilitate those sharings of best practices, all the resources, research, and then just putting together a more cohesive and coordinated approach. Again, this is a multidisciplinary interprofessional approach to handling these um, cases and Chagas disease in the United States. All right, I do believe Maya. Oh, I have one more model. I, I will just quickly show this is something we did with the task force. Um, just looking at how to get to healthcare providers and you can see all the different groups that we have worked with outside of just healthcare providers. And lastly, I do have one more. That collaboration is key. This is the map. Um, I believe it was the last one that came out of the positive blood donors that you can see on the far left. And then also just to show the states that where we do have um, triatamines, not necessarily confirmed local transmission, but we do have the kissing bugs that live in these states. And you can see it's it's been creeping up. So it's um, a lot of places in the United States and also the creeping up may not just be that they're new to the area, it could be that awareness is creating people doing more surveillance. Um, so I just wanted to bring that up as well. Okay, Maya, you ready? I can direct the slides, you just tell me when. Okay, sure, yes. So thank you so much, Paula. So again, um, my name is Maya Carion. I'm, uh, so I, I do work for um, DNDI, so Drugs for Neglected Diseases Initiative, but I'm uh, presenting this sort of more on behalf of my um, the, the work I did while I was faculty at Boston University and also as part of my um, dissertation at um, the uh, Boston University School of Public Health. Um, so just in terms of talking about some of those prevalence numbers and things that um, Paula had brought up, so there have been a limited number of studies done over the, um, basically the past, well, since 2010. Um, there's been a few that have been um, done a little bit more recently. Um, but you can see here that these, you know, all relatively small studies, um, but that some uh, had quite significant, I would say, um, prevalence numbers. So we certainly have um, Chagas in the United States. It's certainly a problem. And as Paula mentioned, while we often refer to that 300,000 um, uh, people approximately, um, I think a lot of people who work in Chagas disease that you talk to would say that that is probably um, vastly undercounting how many people have it. Um, next. And um, so Paula already mentioned some of this, um, but there is definitely a lack of physician awareness and knowledge, um, and not just physicians, but generally in the healthcare system. Um, there's been some studies looking at that as well. Um, but even among infectious disease physicians, um, we see that there is a, a lack of uh, really awareness about Chagas disease um, for those based in the US. And um, oftentimes, these patients are not actually making it to infectious disease physicians anyway, because as Paula mentioned, they may be asymptomatic. They might be asymptomatic for decades um, until something is is seriously wrong. So, um, uh, so part of what uh, I'll, I'll talk about is kind of efforts to try to improve some of this um, awareness uh, among primary care. We also have limited guidelines on who to screen and how. Um, so there are, again, Paula shared some examples. So there are um, uh, technical groups or, or, or groups of Chagas experts based in the US that have 
um, sort of set forth some guidelines and things that have been published, but we don't have official CDC guidelines around um, who to screen um, and, and exactly um, how to do that. And it is a question that comes up um, a lot too. So we have um, recommendations, but officially there's no, um, none of the professional societies have guidelines on screening um, either. Um, the testing, which we didn't get into too much and, and won't, but there is um, there are different tests that can be done. As you saw, you really should have um, a, a first screening test done and then a confirmatory test done. Um, but our tests, unfortunately, are also not perfect, um, both the rapid test that Paula mentioned, but also just our general ser serological tests. Um, so that can lead to some confusion. And then again, um, sort of patient barriers in terms of knowledge, in terms of stigma, in terms of access to healthcare, um, and just fears around the disease. Next. So um, so part of um, a, a five-year cooperative agreement um, for uh, with the CDC, um, with some colleagues at Boston University and Boston Medical Center and um, the Boston University School of Medicine and School of Public Health, um, we started this program called INSEC, which was Implementing Novel Strategies for Education and Chagas Testing. Um, and these are sort of the main goals, but what I'm going to really talk about is kind of that first um, point. So it was about improving knowledge and awareness among healthcare providers um, and really going to the providers themselves and learning um, from them what they know are the barriers or challenges and what um, and also what in being presented a model for screening or how screening is done, what they expect in their um, particular uh, facilities or clinics would be um, barriers. So thank you to those of you on this call who actually participated in this research because there are some of you um, on here. So next slide. Um, this is might be a little bit small to read, but um, basically the way we collected the data was we had both group interviews and in-depth interviews. So the group interviews were done um, uh, with providers who were not screening for Chagas disease, um, but who were identified as being in areas where there is the likelihood of um, of um, some uh, of generally speaking of large um, populations of people from highly endemic um, countries, um, and so just kind of getting a sense of of uh, one, their learning style and how to actually get them engaged and learning about something that isn't a priority uh, necessarily for them. Um, and then, like I said, pr also presenting a, a model of a screening program that is carried out in East Boston um, Neighborhood Health Center. That is the only um, routine primary care screening site for Chagas disease um, and kind of getting their feedback on, on how that might work in their situations. Um, and then the in-depth interviews that um, were conducted were with people at East Boston Neighborhood Health Center um, and getting their um, feedback around sort of what has worked well in the program, what could be improved, what they think that um, others who want to replicate the program, which is um, also kind of one of the goals of this cooperative agreement, what they um, would recommend or what they wish they had known, um, et cetera. So we did focus again on primary care providers. So you can see we have a few non-primary um, care as well, but um, you know, focusing really on, on family medicine, pediatric, OBGYN, um, general internal medicine. Um, next slide. And so this is a poster that was presented at, um, at ASTMH last year, um, just summarizing how, you know, the, the results of uh, that research. And I think, and you'll see that in, in part, this is what inspired our case-based approach today, but that across the board providers um, said that really case-based learning was their favorite way to learn, um, particularly when it's something that they weren't necessarily sure was so relevant to their practice. Also making it as simple as possible in the workflow. Um, and then really stressed um, um, repeatedly uh, that having either professional guidelines um, or CDC guidelines would really encourage them to screen. In fact, 
a lot of them basically said, I don't even care what it is, but if my professional organization says I should be screening, I will screen. Um, so next slide. So what doesn't work? So trying to force people to be champions for something like this and really any kind of less common neglected disease, um, you really need champions. You need people who are motivated to move this forward. As we all know, everyone is extremely busy, has lots of competing priorities um, and you know, very little time with patients if you're a provider to try to cover everything. So having people who are just motivated and really interested in, in moving this forward is so important, but you can't force people to do that. So if you can identify a champion, it might just not be the time. Um, because I think one of the things to really think about is you may only have one chance to introduce screening. Um, and if it doesn't go well, then you may not get that chance again, or at least not for a while. So you really want to make sure that you're approaching it, um, you know, in, in a way that's going to be as successful as possible. Um, repeatedly, we heard that uh, kind of talking about the background. So, um, you know, talking a lot about the epidemiology and the the biology, the the statistics and things like that around it was not super interesting when um, providers are, again, kind of learning about something that that is not necessarily their priority. Um, I think starting um, assuming people don't really have a lot of interest in the topic. And so trying to make it engaging um, and also kind of starting with the basics. And the social media question was interesting and you may have seen on the poster. Um, I think uh, one of the most surprising things from this research has been that um, providers actually use uh, social media very differently depending on their specialties. So in the ID world, I feel like we use social media, at least we did, use social media and, tw and Twitter slash X um, a lot. Um, and across the board from pretty much all of the providers that I spoke to said they do not use, um, primary care providers said they do not use social media for their professional tasks. And so I think in recent years, there's been this big push to like do a lot on social media. And those of you who have done it know that it's incredibly time consuming. And actually it turns out that maybe for this group, um, that's not you know a good use of time and, and resources, so. Next. Maya, can I just jump in and say yeah. that we have a Facebook page and I spend most of my time um, identifying bugs. It's not generally <laughs> helpful information. It's people sending bug pictures. Um, but we are, I will just little, little shout out that we are working on a podcast though. And we're titling it the Kissing Bug Chronicles. And that should come out um, hopefully in the middle of April around International Chagas Disease Day. And I'm hoping like maybe podcasts, like we're always thinking about new ways to reach people um, and working, we work with the Rural Telementoring Training Center on developing a podcast to reach like rural networks. So it's it's really interesting how we have to uh, uh, attack this education awareness raising. And I will say that podcast was another thing that was asked about, um, that I asked about during this research. And there was a sort of a, a mix. There was definitely people who, there were a couple of podcasts that were very common among a lot of the providers. So fingers crossed. <laughs> uh, we have another question uh, from Bernardo Moreno. Uh, yeah. Was there any data about what was interesting to providers? Yep, and that's what I'm gonna talk about. <laughs> so that's oh, okay. I wasn't okay. going to, yep. Um, so what does work? Um, so people really wanted short and focused messaging. So they don't wanna sit through an hour long talk. Um, they would like a shorter talk and they would really like at the end to basically leave the talk and again, know what they need to implement this into their practice and not necessarily all of sort of the background and like all of the, things that those of us who are, you know, um, deeply embedded in the Chagas world know now by by heart. So really, at the end of the day, the end of the presentation, what are these three things that they need to know in order to really start screening, basically, if that's what our objective is? Um, having shareable resources, so things that they can pass on to their um, administration or their colleagues or something to try to, you know, gain interest in that and, and kind of make it easy integrating things into workflow. So you can kind of see, I think there, um, but uh, having Shag is just part of the screening um, panel. So on the bottom, you can see it's a migrant, you might not be able to see, but it's a migrant screening panel and it has um, 
sort of all of the most common um, tests that you would order if you were seeing a, a new migrant or immigrant um, patient for the first time. Um, and so including just the simple act of including Chagas on that and maybe a little blurb that says, if your patient comes from these areas, you know, screen, um, simple things like that really do end up making a, a big difference because it's almost like they don't have to try to remember um, that, you know, because again, of course, there's there's multiple, many tests that need to be done. Um, alerts were a mixed bag. So some really wanted pop-ups to remind them. And some said that absolutely not, do not add any more pop-ups to my, to my EMR. Um, trying to, this is what I just mentioned, but also trying to frame it within sort of another risk group that gets perhaps a bit more attention. So just in the broad sort of immigrant migrant screening and not trying to kind of create a standalone um, Shaga screening. Um, I already mentioned recommendations and guidelines. Um, and then I already mentioned sort of the flip side is if you do have people who are enthusiastic, really capitalizing on that because they are going to be the ones you're not going to be there every day. So or I'm not going to be there every day, I guess. Um, so if you have people who are really enthusiastic and, and can kind of carry that forward, it's really, really important. Next. And this is just, I had mentioned, um, so this is recently published by um, some people who are on this call um, where there were some um, testing recommendations, um, but again, no sort of formal CDC guidelines. So this is kind of what we generally refer to um, when people are asking. And I just, I'm not gonna go through this table. This is from that paper, but the thing that I just wanna highlight here is if you look at the strength of, so on the, on the right-hand side, the strength of the, um, you know, basically how much we believe in some of these cases that someone should be screened um, and you can see the quality of the evidence. So just to highlight again that we are still lacking a lot of research in these areas um, and we just need to be conducting a lot more um, research, so. Next. And then I think my last slide um, is just, and this is a little bit of a plug, I guess, for, for my, my former colleagues, um, my former team at, at, at BU, but we did create, um, as part of the um, cooperative agreement, we did create a number of resources, including a handbook um, that helps people learn how to set up a screening program for Chagas disease and has really practical information and was informed by some of those interview by all of those interviews that were conducted, as well as sort of um, personal experiences in, in setting up screening. So it's available for free. You can download it from the website. There's also infographics, um, posters, um, postcards and things. And you can also email the team. So it's shagas at bu.edu. So quite easy um, if you want printed materials and they will provide them. And there are also pins. I forgot about the pins. Um, so just a resource if you are interested um, and they are happy to consult um, about how to get things going. So thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I believe that uh, we didn't, we answered all of the questions you answered. The Royal We answered all the questions that came in, but just to be a reminder that at the hub, and the web link is in there uh, further up. The slides will be shared as well as today's presentation. We have uh, just a couple more minutes in case there is an, another question from anyone that, that uh, hopefully we can take advantage of these last few moments. Otherwise, we'd like to go to the slides where uh, we do the evaluation. Is that accurate? Yes. Ah, case discussion, I lied. We, we still have 30 minutes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, see, I'm on another planet. Please move forward, Maya. That's okay. And I apologize, my um, internet just momentarily freaked out. So if I disappear, Maya, will you uh, happily take over? Yes. <laughs> All right. And maybe, um, Kato, if you want to have those slides pulled up in case that happens again, that really, um, you never know these days, right, when you're at home working. Um Thank you, Maya, so much. Um, I did miss your last 30 seconds, but I assume we're going to launch into the case discussions. And so um, Maya and I put our heads together and we talked about what are the most common 
scenarios that we hear. And we're gonna talk um, through this. And this is what echo sessions truly are about. It's brainstorming. And so we hope that you all will just shout out what you think. Um, you can raise your hand or you can just unmute yourself or you can also put it in the chat, whatever you feel more comfortable with. But we're gonna talk about two different scenarios. We have a third one uh, geared up if we have time, but we're gonna talk about the two most common ones. And the first one is a letter from a blood bank. And as I mentioned earlier, first time blood donors, we do test them. And again, there's some you know complications with this in terms of the testing has to be confirmed and um, the communication has to be there about what happened. So we're gonna read a little bit about this patient. The patient is a 32 year old male living in South Texas, originally from Mexico, but moved to the United States at the age of two and decided to participate for the first time in a blood drive in his community. Four weeks later, he received a letter from the Blood Donation Center informing him that he had tested positive for Chagas disease. The letter advised him to consult with his doctor for further information and also mentioned that he would be unable to donate blood again in the future. I would say there's a caveat to that, that they have changed the rules about that, that if you are confirmed negative, I believe you are allowed to donate um, in the future, but I'm not gonna really go over that too much. Um, upon receiving this letter, he immediately looked up Chagas disease online to educate himself about the condition and its implication for his health. This is a very common scenario. I've actually heard this many times um, that this, this happens. And what we're gonna talk about is um, what would happen next. All right, so potential next steps. This is where I'm kind of hoping um, people will be able to, to chime in a little bit. What do you think would be the next step for this person? Maybe the obvious next step and then maybe the not so obvious next step. And you can put it in the chat or unmute yourself. So I think just as a reminder, so it's a patient that received a letter from the blood bank and comes to see you um, per the recommendation of the letter. And they've done a little, little bit of research um, so far, but they're coming to you because that's what the letter says. And so Sandra yeah. says trace transmission. Okay. Trace transmission. So find out how they travel, maybe do a travel history, um, find out you know if they've seen triatamines around their house. Great. I've actually got a couple of scenarios geared up here and I'll bring these up. Um, and this Maya just kind of goes back to if, if you're not the primary care physician in this scenario, we're like, we're thinking clearly about outside, what would this patient do? What might happen? Confirmatory testing, absolutely. So patient goes to urgent care with the letter and asks to be tested. And I bring this up because this is actually what happens a lot of times. Um, and says um, they take proactive steps to address the positive test, but they seek immediate testing and consultation at an urgent care facility. Anybody who maybe has worked at an urgent care facility or understands what that looks like, um, oftentimes uh, people will go to the ER if they don't have a primary care physician or they'll go to the local urgent care. Um, what would happen next? Um, do you think that the urgent care provider would be able to uh, test this person? And if so, would they know which tests uh, to run. And so the question, do we have the tests? Um, absolutely, this would be um, an important question. What, what we have heard in the past is that people would present to any provider and the provider would sometimes say, you know, we don't have this disease in the United States. It's probably a false positive. You don't need to worry about it. I'm hoping now with increased education and awareness, especially I know in Texas, there's been a lot of it. Um, that wouldn't be the case. And so maybe that urgent care provider would have to look up what testing needs to be done, but this person is going to ultimately need to connect with the primary care physician. There you go. I like that. Urgent care recommends um, a follow-up with PCP. Exactly. So scenario two, this person schedules with his PC provider for an appointment in three weeks. Uh, patient opts for a planned approach, scheduling an appointment with his primary care provider, three weeks to address the test results and discuss further steps. We have to hope that that happens. A lot of times people get quite anxious and so they uh, uh, have a hard time sometimes waiting for this step to happen. Um, so this is what happens. This is what Maya was talking about. So they come to you, they've got this letter. Um, what happens? What happens next? 
Exactly. So Sanders says that's now seven weeks, uh, potentially. Yes. Um, if they tested positive at a blood donation screening, it was not an acute case. So that would have been a chronic case already, just to clarify that. So if this is a chronic case, um, that means that they would need to be tested with um, an antigen-based test, correct? And again, um, knowing that sometimes providers don't always know, they might think that the exposure was seven weeks ago if they started looking things up online. Um, and so also knowing which tests to order would be really important. Um, and then there's scenario three that we're not gonna talk about too much, but disregards the letter because they don't have insurance. And I bring that up because unfortunately this happens uh, a lot of the time. And this is um, where follow-up uh, testing doesn't happen. The letter gets disregarded, unfortunately, not out of, um, a lack of desire to get tested, but an inability or a fear of, and this happens sometimes as well. You know, I wonder, Paula, in um, in a scenario like this, it speaks to obviously, like you already said, a lack of awareness amongst the PCPs as to even what Chagas is. Um, we've had this exact case happen in our center several times, and it's very difficult because they'll come with a letter to the provider. The provider won't know what it is. They'll look it up. They'll see what tests need to be ordered. The test maybe costs $150. The patient said, do I really need it? So it all has to do with lack of, I think, awareness amongst um, PCVs, and I think that really needs to be stressed here, the education. And it would be nice if the blood bank had a more specific kind of algorithm specifically for the primary care provider. So instead of just taking a letter to your provider saying, you know, you need follow up um, to really be a little bit more um, definitive in terms of what that follow up possibly could be, because it's very difficult. We had also a Mexican patient in New York who came with that exact letter. He was older. He he already had heart disease and it was very, very difficult getting him, you know, the confirmatory tests and proper um, interventions. You bring up um, some really, really great points. And that is, um, you know, if you do have this patient that presents and the chance of it being a false positive, looking deeper at uh, the person and what their risk potential is. And so, like you said, were they born in a different endemic region? Um, what were their risks? This person had the risk of not only being born in an endemic region, having a mother from that region, but they also lived in, in, a, in a region of South Texas where there's a lot, quite a bit of triadamine activity. And so um, those three things there would, I think, put them on a higher profile for going ahead and, and recommending testing. Um, but you're, again, you're right, the financial burden can sometimes um, be prohibitive. And so thinking about that is incredibly important. I love the idea of adding a link on those letters. And I think that this is something we should talk about more as a collaborative group is, you know, what the different blood donation centers, they all have different um, protocols that they follow, right? It's not just this one giant organization. And so even just having the CDC recommended guidelines or not recommended guidelines, but the CDC website about Chagas disease that has information for healthcare providers could be really useful to have that on that letter. I imagine that some do, but I also imagine that some don't. That'd be something to look into to find out who all have it on there and who don't. And I think just, I, I don't um, know a hundred percent, but I assume there might also be a little bit of an issue with the fact that there are no official guidelines. Um, and so maybe some hesitancy in terms of, you know, what they can, whether it's a legal issue or something um, kind of recommend, which only adds again to the confusion of the the sort of primary care providers or whoever ends up getting this patient with this letter um, when they're not familiar with what needs to be done. Absolutely. And you bring up a, another point about not having those um, care guidelines, but also FDA approval for treatment um, is also only in children. And so that brings up another issue about how do you make recommendations for treatment whenever it's not FDA approved in the United States for use in adults and it is off label. A lot of those different um, complexities, but again, this goes back to our collaborative approach of there's a lot of resources out there to help guide those providers and making sure that they know where those are. And I think that that's the, the, the beauty of all the work that's been going on in the last decade or so is, is you know putting all those resources out there. 
So if scenario one is followed and the second test is positive, let's just say, um, actually it should be scenario two. Let's go to scenario two. I think I'm forgetting how I laid this out, but either scenario, um, they end up getting confirmatory. They end up getting a second test basically from a, a lab, a commercial lab, and it does test positive. Um, so what should happen next? Refer the individual to an infectious disease specialist for confirmatory testing and treatment options. That confirmatory testing would be done at the CDC. Um, involve the local health department so that they could help get that sample to the CDC and gather guidance on for further management. This is one option of what could happen. Um, there's other things that could happen, but this is what we're talking about is also can a primary care provider um, provide the next steps, the management, the treatment. And we're gonna bring up a couple different scenarios where if your person is insured and they have access, this is a possibility that they could be referred to an infectious disease specialist. Um, if they are an FQHC, the FQHC may also have somebody that is an ID specialist that could jump in and support them. Um, but if they are underinsured or uninsured, this is where we start to run into some, some issues with being able to confirm and access treatment. And so um, I think this is what I was, I guess, saying. Um, oh, I guess I did have scenario one as the urgent care was still there, was, um, you know, that urgent care provider. Actually, I don't think that would happen. Now, if I'm thinking, we're thinking a little bit harder about it, I don't think the urgent care provider would actually uh, be able to give them much more information. They would really refer them out to a, to a, a primary care physician. But again, um, if they do have connections, this is what they, they could do is get that referral out there and, and put a plan together. What happens if the second test yields inconclusive results? What do you all think would be the next uh, steps? First test was positive from the blood donation center. Second test was inconclusive or just you have these discordant results. What would happen next? Uh, send to a state lab. Um, maybe if you're in Texas and the, the lab is testing, that might be an option. Uh, most state labs don't test for Chagas disease that I know of. Um, so I would say that um, calling, this is, this is, I'll give you the answer. This is uh, calling your local health department or your state health department to ask for um, support in submitting a confirmatory test to CDC. That would be next steps. Um, how that process works and how the physician has to work through that process um, might be challenging if they've never done it before. And so um, finding guidance from, again, their local health departments, which is why I bring in this idea that, and gratitude for all the local health departments that are here today and that continue to come to these calls and these echo sessions is because they're also that person that helps navigate the physician and, and the patient for the most part to this confirmatory testing process. And so um, that is exactly what would what should happen is, is they should um, seek out confirmatory testing. Uh, could you do a second commercial lab test? You could, but there's no guarantee that it would be uh, using a different uh, hemogen-based test. And so Quest and LabCorp and Arup and Mayo, they tend to fluctuate with what tests they're using. And you don't always know if you're gonna be getting the exact same one and they don't always um, give up that information to you which test they're actually using. And so that is why we would recommend uh, further confirmatory testing from the CDC. And just exploring this a little bit more is negative versus positive results. So if they receive that initial test result, you know, the most important thing is to discuss with them what the potential outcomes are for that positive result. So as a provider, you wanna make sure you kind of understand what those next steps would be. Um, explore that uh, confirmatory testing and look at treatment options. And, you know, with treatment options, it, it's, you have to do some, um, some testing on the patient to ensure that they're eligible for treatment. There's things to consider such as underlying health conditions, age, um, anything else that might be going on. If they're already having symptoms, if they've you know, slowly been um, leaning in towards that chronic determinant phase where they do have symptoms, whether they would be potential for treatment. 
So this is where, you know, having a physician experience in Chagas disease is really important. And also having those resources um, available for physicians that uh, would, would be able to treat them available to them. Another thing that needs to be brought up too is uh, delving into that potential risk and testing options for family members. And so what happens if this 32 year old male also lives in a household with his family, his wife, um, four children, who should be tested next? Um, maybe the mom could be tested, the wife could be tested, also testing the children. Oftentimes we're finding when we find one positive patient um, in a household that you will find other positive patients living within that household because they either have similar risks or you know, come from similar backgrounds. So that's also really important. And when that happens, who has to be involved in that? It, it's not just the primary care physician at that point, it becomes also the adult infectious disease specialist, the pediatrician, uh, the pediatric ID specialist, um, all of those providers have to come in. If the mom is pregnant, then it becomes an OBGYN. Um, and we're going to talk about that in a second. And then what happens if they're in a rural setting versus an urban setting? This is where I have a lot of interest in thinking about if you're in a rural setting, um, how does that primary care provider connect with a specialist if there's no way for them to physically get there? Can we use telemedicine as an option to do consultations um, with the patients and their families or just the provider to, to find out what should the next steps be? So Maya, do you wanna present the next case? Yes. Um, so now um, for our second case, we have a 26 year old pregnant woman who tests positive. She's new to the city um, and she was just going for routine care. Um, and the clinic had a, um, a screening program and they were screening um, uh, women with a history of, of travel or residence in Latin America. So she was born in the US, but both her mother and her father are from El Salvador. And she lives with her mother, grandmother, and sister. And she has two other children um, who are eight and five. So she reports that she sometimes travels to El Salvador to visit uh, family, but she hasn't in the last um, eight years. Um, so what are the next steps and who should be involved here? So you already know that she's confirmed as positive. She's pregnant. Um, she lives with a number of family members and has other children. And maybe if you're not sure of the next steps, who do you think should be involved would be another question. And let's say this is a, that she, she's going for her um, for prenatal care, her first prenatal check at this clinic. Um, so refer to cardio checkup, um, test other family members. Yeah, so definitely um, uh, testing the other family members, particularly um, her mother um, and um grandmother. So again, because of congenital transmission, so would be really important. Um, and her sister, um, potentially, again, because of that congenital transmission, if her mother uh, was positive. So um, definitely want to want to check at all of the family members, if possible, her other children as well, because since she's positive, she may have uh, passed it on to those children. Um, in terms of the cardio checkup. Um, yeah, so um, we have some cardiologists on the line who can maybe speak in more detail about this. Um, but uh, I, I think, yes, you would want to see what kind of um, potential cardiac complications maybe have developed at this point. Sheba, did you want to? Yeah, wanna... hi. Yeah, hi. this is Sheba Mamandi. We usually start off with uh, an EKG. Um, and an echocardiogram to assess uh, the left ventricular function and uh, possible abnormalities on the EKG that show evidence of cardiac involvement. 
Thank you. And then we take it from there. Um, and we said, um, someone mentioned, so we would involve her OBGYN, pediatrician, and test other family members. Yep. So another thing, so we, we got testing the other kids and family members. Um, so testing the baby when they're born, which again is uh, unfortunately not super straightforward <laughs> as you may have noticed with most things related to Chagas. So the baby should be tested when they are first born. Um, and then they need to be tested again at generally around nine months um, just to confirm that they're negative um, because of um, uh, uh, antibodies that can be passed on um, from the mother. So it does require two sets of of testing usually. Um, and then does anyone know about treatment and when we would want to treat the mother or want to take a guess? This would also be if pending that they did not have any cardiac involvements or GI issues and that they were cleared for possible treatment, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. So maybe just in the interest of time. Um, so there is some conversation around this, but generally speaking, um, we don't treat pregnant women until after they have, um, they are no longer pregnant. So um, after they've given birth, um, usually that's when you, you would treat. Um, we have very limited data in terms of um, uh, the effects on both the fetus and, um, and on actually breastfeeding as well. So, um, yep. Yeah, so depending on whether she chooses to breastfeed or not. Um, so there are some, again, conversations around what, what is the, the best option. Um, but most providers would say to wait until they are, have given birth and have stopped breastfeeding, um, in order to treat. I was also gonna, just going to add too that um, taking note that, you know, depending on how the mom feels, having that discussion with her about the pros and cons of waiting for treatment, it, it could be an important conversation because it is a slow progressing disease. And if the mom did want to breastfeed for six months and wait for treatment, um, depending on her situation, that might be perfectly fine. Um, but also, you know, being able as a provider to explain that to the person and, you know, walk her through that is really important because I think a lot of people do panic when they find out that they have um, an, a disease and, and that they need to be treated for it. So I think that's important too. Okay, so Paula, I don't know if we want to kind of I can just go through this quickly, but so I'm already mentioned. So if the baby was negative at birth, you would still want to follow up and test them um, nine months um, later, um, more or less. Um, if the grandmother is age 65 and tested positive, then um, again, recommendations around treatment depend on kind of what kind of progression they might have had. Um, and also the, there's generally not treated after the age of 65, though, again, this is a little bit provider specific. Um, so, and then if the other kids are negative and the sister is negative, then there's really no sort of threat or issue um, uh, with, you know, them becoming infected because um, it's unlikely that they, they would uh, have vector borne transmission um, where they're living. So, and as we talked about, it takes a village. So we, you know, we would want to involve, we got some of these, but of course the pediatrician, um, uh, pediatric ID if possible, um, uh, an adult ID for the mom. So treatment is generally done by um, infectious or, or, um, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, is, is generally uh, managed by the by an infectious disease physician, so not adult ID um, doc in this case. Um, but the, yes, OBGYN, obviously, if that's not who's seeing them, would need to be involved as well. And then depending on what the findings were from the cardio workup, um, the cardiologist or GI specialist, um, if there's suspected uh, already uh, complications. 
All right. I don't know that we have to totally go through all of this, but I think we were just, um, Maya and I were thinking out loud about, you know, what should happen next um, and who should be involved. And I think we just kind of covered that already. But um, what I don't think was mentioned though, is again, like the health department being contacted, um, any confirmatory testing that has to happen, if it's a reportable condition in that state or county, what does that look like? Uh, who, who are all the different uh, players involved in this patient care? And one of the things I think, and I hope you don't mind Maya if I just jumped in, <laughs> but yeah. I was thinking about is that um, patient navigation, like this is a lot. This would be a lot for a pregnant mom, especially with a newborn and other children and living in an extended household to navigate the healthcare system and to um, have to do all of this. And I really feel like this is where you have those patient navigators, community health workers, and others that can really help support this entire framework of collaboration that has to happen for everybody to get the appropriate diagnosis, the appropriate treatment, the appropriate care, and then also just to manage the anxiety and all of the things that come along with this, the financial issues that might occur. Um, and so this is where I, I really like to think about in this type of a situation, it would require um, a lot. And oh, school nurses, that's great. I love that. Nurses, um, absolutely. So, you know, how do you how do you talk with the families about this and how do you understand what's going on? Um, I love that. This is great. So a lot of different people, a lot of different um, players involved in all of these scenarios. And just um, to, if I can add, so now that we've maybe sufficiently scared you off from um, screening patients because of how complicated it can be, I do want to say that, and speaking from sort of personal experience of helping sites set up screening, that it sounds complicated, but once you have a system in place and things um, running smoothly, it really does um, make it so much easier. So again, a plug for the, the handbook that we developed, which um, takes you through some of that and also just reaching out um, to um, any number of, of people involved in, in Chagas, deeply involved in Chagas in the US, because I think we're all very um, keen to, to get more screening. We know that it's there um, until we have more data. We probably won't get recommendations, um, official guidelines and things, but um, it's sort of a, a, a catch 22 because without those guidelines, we have trouble getting screening done too. So um, so again, it's, it's not, it's complicated, but it is definitely, um, there's lots of tools and, and people in place to help support um, setting up screening. I like that you brought that up, Maya, because um, we kind of tried to throw the book at all of this. Like, this is all the different types of complicated scenarios that could happen. They're not all this complicated, but it is almost a case by case basis that we address the issue. When you do get a positive case, you know, you kind of have to dive in a little bit deeper and um, find out, you know, what are what are the other issues going on. And and I think that that once you've seen a case, it after you treat that first case or see the first case, it, it tends to get a little easier what we've heard from providers. And I agree. And I would also just like to plug the US Chagas Disease Network as another really great resource that's been put together. Um, you can look them up online. There's a website and they have a map where it shows where there are providers in each of the states where we have identified um, providers that have knowledge of Chagas disease that you could contact. And I think their contact information is even in there. There you go. Thank you, Maya, for putting that in the chat. That's a really great resource. And again, you know, there's just any, you know, you can Google Shagas and um, find a lot of different resources across the United States. And um, there you go. And also there's the, the Boston University site as well. And um, we're not going to talk about a cardiac patient, but I did want to just kind of um, wrap this up. And Amaya, feel free to jump in on this as well. But I was Thinking a lot about community awareness is important, but without provider awareness, uh, it's really difficult to move forward. And so ensuring that our healthcare providers and their networks and the extended networks of their um, patients also have all the information that they need is really critical. And uh, also thinking about sensitive populations that require special considerations and um, you know, working in places also where there is a lot of stigma around the disease. It's important to think about patients and privacy. And obviously that's an important consideration, but understanding that um, you know, it might be difficult for a, a patient to talk with their family members about getting testing. And so working through all of that is important. 
and that we absolutely need more screening and treatment options. We've been talking a lot about uh, screening pregnant women as sort of our first step in the United States to implement some more screening programs there as a targeted effort. And I think that's an area of focus that we're really working on hard and that would help us better understand the prevalence and uh, the importance of increasing our screening programs. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. This has been really wonderful. We're, we now are at the end of our time. I'm so sorry I jumped the gun before. And, and yes, thank you for the acknowledgments. I believe that before we lose everybody at the end here, we would like to go ahead and move to the closing slides. Um, uh, is that correct, Kate, or am I making things up yet again? Excellent. So this is just to make sure that if you would like to receive your CME or CNA credits, uh, you need to uh, complete the evaluation form. And so the link is right there or the QR code. Um, I, I agree with the comments in the, the chat. This was fantastic. Really, really wonderful news to remind you that again, the entire, uh, the slides and the entire presentation will be available at the hub in about a week. Uh, and so there's also the link there for filling out the evaluation survey in the chat. I think we are at time. And so I think we will go ahead. Uh, thank you. The announcement for the World Chagas Day Symposium, April the 12th. Um, and there's the registration link uh, for that as well. But I think we need to go ahead and, and thank you and uh, say goodbye. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Thank you.